I'm Lisa Stone. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Parenting Aces. Welcome to the Parenting Aces podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Stone. In last week's episode, we talked about the red, orange, green, yellow progression with Coach Michelle Brown, and we really focused on the uh, more technical aspects of the game, what kids should be learning at each stage, what the benchmarks are for progressing from one color ball to the next. And I hope y'all found that really helpful and useful, especially those of you who have young children just starting out in tennis. This week, we're going to be talking with Coach Todd Whittem once again, and we're so lucky to get him so many times in recent weeks. But Todd is going to talk about the tennis progression from a different angle, the tactical angle. And I think it's really, really interesting to hear what Todd has to say, not only about when tactics should be introduced into tennis teaching, but also how to progress through the tactical understanding of the game. And so I'm going to be quiet because Todd and I chatted for a really long time this this week, um, and I don't want to take up too much of y'all's time. So go ahead and relax and enjoy listening to Coach Todd Whittem talking about tactical progression for young players. Oh my gosh, Todd Whittem, I get you again. This is incredible. Well, thanks once again, Lisa, for inviting me back. Yeah, I have a little time during lunch today, so uh, let's let's talk about some important topics. Well, I love this because on last week's show, we focused on 10 and under, well, really 12 and under, the red, orange, green, yellow progression. And it was an issue that one of my listeners had asked me to address, so I was really happy to be able to do that for him. And Michelle Brown gave some great, great information. And I just want to say to the people that listened last week, I have added some information to the show notes on that episode, so please go check it out. There's even more detail. So if you have a kid that's in the red, orange, green right now, this will be really helpful for you. But Todd, what you and I are going to talk about today is really more detail about the youth tennis progression and the benchmarks that players should be reaching and what you're seeing working with some of the older kids that come to you um, that they just really missed in their own development. So let's jump in. All right, let's do it. All right. So, so let's start. I mean, I, I know red, orange, green is not your area of expertise, but certainly the developmental pathway is. And what are some of the early things that players should be getting and that you're seeing that they're just flat out not getting? Sure. So a lot of, a lot of many of the kids I've trained over, since 2010, I'm seeing a little bit of a common common theme and I don't know I don't know a lot about their their development prior to me other than them telling me kind of what they were working on and those types of things. But I'm seeing a lot of kids that maybe their strokes are maybe not natural. They don't really understand the side of the ball that they need to hit. Sometimes their head is moving a lot. Um, Many times physically, they, they don't understand how to move. Maybe the steps are too big at times. Maybe the steps are a little too small at times. Um, Maybe the swings are too big. And so a lot of these things can be really, really weeded out at a young age. If you find a coach that is very good with fundamentals, with grips and swings and movement and these types of things. So for me, when, when, when the child is older, these things should be said, and hopefully you're not working on them, but many times we are. So it just really depends on whether, your child has that great coach to work on these very important fundamentals uh, in, in the early steps of tennis. When you say the strokes aren't natural, what does that mean? Sure. So many times you, well, not many, many times, but you'll see, you'll see children with hitches in, in their swings. And so when, when the child is, is young, they can get away with it because the ball is coming slower. So a lot of things, 
that children can get away with at a young age isn't going to be very good for them at, at an older age when the ball is coming much faster. So if, if the child has hitches in their swing or they've been taught different steps on how to swing and it's not a natural free-flowing swing, as they get older, the, the ball will come a lot faster and they'll end up hitting the ball quite late. Interesting. And so what do you do about that? I mean, if you get a kid that's suffering from that, that just did not get the, as you say, the good fundamentals early, how do you fix that? You fix it. (laughs) (laughs) You have to day in and day out, you have to fix it. So a a, a lot of times a a child maybe doesn't know how to move properly. So the ball is too far from them. The ball is too close. Their elbow then becomes very close to their body. When they're, when they're trying to hit the ball or they're trying to move out of the way of the ball as, as, the, as the ball is, is approaching them and they're about to strike it. There, there's, so many, there's so many things that, that, that I'm looking at on a, on a daily basis to, to fix and, and, and do and, and, and all these things that it's, it's hours every day to, to, to clean it up. And then once you clean it up, then you can go on to other aspects of, of, of their tennis training. Mm, interesting. And I mean, this is a problem that seems to come up quite a bit. I mean, I even, you know, when my son was training, of course, he suffered from some of this. Um, we heard it from other families where the kids just did not get those solid fundamentals and had to relearn or unlearn bad habits and relearn good habits and all of that. What does that do in terms of the overall development of the player? Well, it's hard and, and it depends on the age as well. Um, but, but it's hard because you're, you're, you're telling the student that, that this needs to, needs to be fixed. And, and usually they know that needs to be addressed and, and, and fixed. And they might not be a hundred percent sure how long it's going to take or the amount of hours daily it's going to take. And so that, that could be a little bit of a, of a tough conversation, but to me, the, between the parents, the children, and the, and the, and the coach, well, everything has to be communicated so that you understand exactly what's going to be worked on and, and those types of things. So, but is it fun? No. And, and I can, and I can tell you, I was in a meeting with, with some of the best former professionals uh, that, that ever touched a racket and, and, and what, what, what struck a chord in my brain was that Yvonne Lendl was there and he was speaking about how he had, such an amazing coach at a young age that taught proper fundamentals. And he was speaking about how you need to get off to a great start fundamentally so that the rest of the, of, of the process can become a, a more smooth process. So that, that definitely struck a chord with me as well as I'm, I'm seeing this coming, coming through my door that, you know, fun, fundamentally we need to fix these things. And, and many times it's, it's, it's a little bit late in the ball game, but, if you want that child to progress and, and for them to attain their, their goals and dreams with tennis, it, it needs to be addressed and it needs to be fixed. Mm-hmm. And, and so for you, what do you see as the biggest challenge in terms of getting this stuff fixed and helping these kids move to the next level? Sure. Well, we're speaking about changing strokes, but what I can tell you is that, Changing a stroke and cleaning it up is is not the most difficult part of my day. It's changing a mentality. It's uh-huh. teaching discipline. It's teaching that wh- whoever you're working with that it's going to take a lot of repetitions the right way to be able to to understand how this should be done. That that's really what's going on. That to me that's what a a great coach works on. It, it's not it's not oh we can develop a beautiful forehand or backhand and these types of things and and really, I mean, many, many people can do that, but the, the, the tough part is actually changing a mentality, changing a discipline, changing how long a child can focus for, how, how disciplined they can be about not only their tennis, but their life in general. Interesting. Interesting. And I mean, that is, you know, the mental side of the game and that, that mentality to come out day after day and give 110% because that really is what it takes. It, it, it's tough. And, you know, there, there's a lot of talk about how our kids are soft and how 
parents now are trying to pad everything for their kids, make everything easier for their kids. And if a child has the goal of being a competitive tennis player at a high level, making things soft is not doing them any favors, right? It It is not. It's, it's tough. Um, things are becoming easier in our society. We have a lot of great technology around us, things, things we can get done very quickly in today's day and age. I look back uh, when I was training as, as a junior player and um, I didn't have these things around me. No, no one did at that time. But now you, a couple presses of a button, you can find out so many different things just on, just on your, your smartphone. So obviously the, the, time, the times are different. People may want things happening a lot quicker today than, than maybe they did in, in, my, in my generation. Um, the philosophy in, in when I was a developing player was you got to go after it all day long and do it over and over and over again until you have it done right. And that's repetition after repetition all day long. And that's really what this game is about. Um, in terms of, in terms of a junior player, when they're out there and they're training or competing and they're having bad moments or getting frustrated in tennis, you're, you're, you're out there by yourself. So that's the tough part. It may be tough for a parent to watch their child have tough moments or play bad matches or not succeed or not achieve their goals. But you really, you really find out what that, what that human being is made of. And, uh, it's, like I said, it's, it's, it's all about communication and, and, and everybody has to be on the same page and understanding what it's going to take and, and work towards those goals every single day. The toughest part, and I, and I can tell you a a little story from, from when I was coming up through junior tennis and, and someone I looked up to who was only about six months older than me was Andy Roddick. And I remember when Andy Roddick was coming through as the number one junior in the world and then breaking into professional tennis was, was, was that he, he was, he actually went through an interview where the reporter asked him, well, what's the difference between being an unbelievable junior player and now coming into professional tennis and, and making it your profession? He said, when you have off days in professional tennis, you don't win. If you have off days in junior tennis, you can still find a way to win. And so that comes from your training. So your, your training, you have to bring it every single day, every moment for you to maximize your ability. To me, that's the toughest part for many of the junior players is that many of them don't understand that at all. They, they, they don't understand mentally and physically the, the grind day in and day out. And, and so they kind of regulate the training from what I'm seeing. And what do I mean by regulating is that once they get to a certain point, they kind of shut it down a little bit. And that's where you have to push it harder. But many of them don't push it harder. They, can't, they get tired or mentally they get tired or the drill went too long. So they lost the discipline or the focus. But these things are trained. You, you can't just expect it to happen if, if you're doing a couple of drills and there's only a couple of balls. It's a, it's a duration of a drill. And then when you get to that certain point, you then want to you then want to push them above what they think they can do. And what does that build? It builds confidence. So it all, it all happens day in and day out every single day. If you're actually doing this properly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's tough. It's exhausting physically and mentally. Um, You know, it's, it's one of those things that, I mean, I remember, and I've talked about this before. I took a lesson on the red clay in Mallorca and after about 10 minutes, I was huffing and puffing. I, you know, was, I couldn't catch my breath. I, I mean, I was, you know, it was just awful. And I remember asking or going over to the side to, to take a water break. And the coach saying to me, oh, no, you don't get to take a water break yet. And I was like, what do you mean? I'm 50 years old and I'm dying out here. <laughs> and he was right. like you don't get to take a break until you're winning tournaments. The ones who win tournaments, they get to take the water breaks. Otherwise you keep pushing to your lessons over. And I thought, Oh my God, (laughs) 
<laughs> this is torture. Right. I mean, it's just brutal. But that was the mentality and the mindset of this academy. And, you know, I, I was obviously, you know, there for fun, but the kids that were there really to train and, and become high level players, this was the attitude that they faced every day when they stepped foot on the court. And they knew that, you know, if they weren't winning tournaments, they didn't get to sit down or take a break, uh, get water until, until practice was done. And I, it just blew my mind to be in that kind of setting. I'd never see anything like that. It's, it's, it's not surprising to me um, that, that, that is happening overseas. Like I said, the mentality has to be properly. Your child is a product of their environment, whether it's a great tough environment or an environment that might be too soft or an environment that just wants the, the paycheck, all, all these, you know, it, the, the results don't lie. And I can tell you to, to fast forward this, this conversation a little bit, but then we'll go back is that the college coaches, many times they'll take a lesser player with a proper mentality than a much better player with a very poor mentality. And that could be very surprising for some of the listeners that are listening, but it's not surprising to me at all because if you have a college tennis team, it's a team and a poor mentality can really take down the system. It's the same thing in my system. My system is very small. It's a very private little system. And anyone who's holding back others with a poor mentality, a poor work ethic, it's going to really hurt my system. So these are always things that, 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 I'm, uh, that I'm looking at to make sure that everyone should be doing what they're doing properly. Right, right. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's important for listeners to understand that all of this information that we're sharing here is not to, you know, make anybody feel bad or – or discourage them. It's in fact, the opposite. It's meant to encourage the kids to work harder, the families to, you know, stay committed to this goal that their child has set for him or herself and to find the best situation so that the kid can reach his or her highest potential. Right. Correct. I I agree a hundred percent. The, the things that, that children can learn on a tennis court, if this is done properly, should be lifelong skills that are going to translate over into other aspects of, of, of their life. The tennis only lasts so long, but you want to really try to maximize what you can do. And, and then, and then you, you move on. It could be college tennis. It could be finishing your, your high school tennis. It could be a professional tennis career. But you want to try to do your best. And if you have that skill of every day going out there with discipline and working at something and not complaining and, 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 and really have the discipline of brain to keep trying and trying and trying, that's what this is about. And, and so if you have those skills, it's going to really translate over into other aspects of, of your life, which is really the most important because the tennis really only lasts so long. Right. And, you know, I, I can just hear people saying, well, but this is all great for, you know, a 15 year old, but what about my six year old, my five year old, who's just starting out in the sport? I mean, surely we have to do stuff to make it fun for him or her to keep the child interested in playing tennis. How do you respond to that kind of question? Sure. It should, it should be fun at, at, at all ages. Um, just like one of the last shows that we did, the competing should be fun. Now, many kids are very stressed out. They may feel pressure, maybe from themselves, maybe from their parents, maybe from their coaches. But overall, they should really have fun competing, but also playing the game of tennis. So in regards to a youngster, a five, six, seven-year-old, eight, eight-year-old, you have to to me, in my opinion, you have to make it challenging for them. They have to enjoy that challenge of maybe it could be hitting a target. It could be developing that nice technique um, or, or learning the proper grip or the proper movement and make it fun, but they should be learning and they should be developing 
those those repetitions and developing those skills and and really trying to develop good focus and concentration and if you can do that at that at that age you're going to be definitely ahead of the ball game right right and i mean there are some kids that at age 5 are not ready for that kind of intensive concentration or you know they're not ready to set a goal of and understand what it takes to reach that goal but there are some kids at a young age who do exhibit those traits and and who are ready and so i think it's it's important for parents and for coaches to have a good understanding of the individual child and how much to push them how much to offer to them uh, at each stage of their development and also to understand when it's time to back off a little bit. Absolutely. There, there's, there's no doubt about it. For example, my son, he plays many different sports. He's four and a half years old. He's, he's played a lot of golf naturally because I've grown up playing golf and he loves to hit golf balls. He can get a hit a golf ball 70, 80 yards already at four and a half years old. And that happened a while ago. And we've put him into a little group session of, of plastic clubs, which for him is actually going backwards because he's already using um, some real golf clubs and everything. And we asked him, would you like to take a, you know, a private lesson? And, and he said, no, I don't want to do that. I want to be in this group. Sure, absolutely. No problem at all. Right. So you have to feel it out. And uh, I think that could work for many young tennis players as well. You have to understand your child. I've, I've trained children that have been incredibly serious about tennis at four and five years old. I've had, I've had kids that, that I've trained that haven't picked up a racket till they were 10 or 12 years old and they end up having great tennis careers. So it just really depends on, depends on the path for each individual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, I, <sighs> The whole issue of burnout in our sport is huge, and I've been posting stuff on our Facebook page about, you know, the issue of um, not having, uh, not attracting girls to the sport, and what we can do to attract more girls. And I mean, there's a lot of conversation going on around these issues now, and I, I want to just be really careful or really clear to make sure that the listeners understand that when we're talking about pushing kids or, or helping them develop that mindset to push themselves, which is really what we want. It's not with the idea of overloading them, stressing them out, causing them to just throw their hands up and give up the sport altogether. We want them to stay with the sport long-term. And one of the ways to get them to do that is to continue to improve and to continue to build on their results and kids that stagnate and, you know, don't see themselves getting better, I think are more likely to quit than the ones that are seeing themselves improve every day. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I, I would, I would definitely agree, agree with that statement. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the real question is how is your child going to get to higher levels of tennis? What is the plan? Who's guiding your child? What is it going to take? What's it going to take from mom and dad? What's it, what's it going to take from, from the coach? What's it, what is it going to take from the child? Um, just th- this morning, one, one of my high-level tennis players, and a, a great player, he was having trouble making 20 balls in a row. Okay, he's done it many times, but he was having trouble. And so I said, and, I, and, I, and really I saw him getting frustrated, which is normal because he's done it before. He was struggling today you know, welcome to life. And, uh, and so, <laughs> right. I mean, it, it ain't going to be peachy every day out there Just for all the listeners listening. It's not, it's not peachy all day, every day out there. Your child is going to struggle at times. Maybe their brain is a little off. Maybe physically they're a little off, whatever. Maybe they're not timing the ball perfectly that day. Who knows? But I said, you can go get water and stop. And I was really testing him. And, 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 and I had a feeling that he wasn't going to stop, but I was giving him the option. Why? Because it's his tennis career. It's mm-hmm. not my tennis career. It's not his parents' tennis career. It's his tennis career. And, and, and really, I was testing him, and I wanted to see where he was at mentally, if he was going to quit or he was going to push through his little, 
you know, his, his tough five minutes during practice. And, uh, and he said, no, no, I'm getting it. I'm, you know, I'm staying out here. And the drill went on for probably could have been 10 to 20 minutes, maybe. And how many kids are going to stay out there and keep grinding away and, and, and trying to get their goal and accomplish the things that they want to accomplish. Well, this particular human being is one of the best players I've ever trained. So it doesn't surprise me, but my transition with this particular player is I'm trying to have him become a man and mature. And so he needs to make decisions on, on his own because I'm not going to be there all the time holding his hand at every tournament, every, every, every practice, which I'm at every practice, but some of the tournaments he, he goes to on his own and he's going to need to learn how to practice properly. He's going to need to learn how to come up with a game plan properly. All these things that, that he's been trained to do, those are the, the, uh, that's really basically the whole package of becoming an athlete. Mm-hmm. So these are all the things that, that I'm looking at so that he keeps progressing through, through to higher levels of tennis. Right. You mentioned game plan and, and knowing how to practice. And, and I want to kind of get back to this whole idea of progression. At, in last week's podcast, we talked about, you know, the progressions from red to orange to green to yellow and, and the specific skills that children need to develop at each level of progression. And we really didn't talk a whole lot about strategy and understanding uh, the the geometry of the court and the physics of the spin and all of that. At what level do you think kids need to be learning that stuff? We're talking strictly about learning how to develop a point in strategy, Lisa? That, yes. I, I said it the long way, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No problem at all. So I think that you, you learn the techniques and, and, and hopefully you learn the movements and you have a lot of great live ball drilling and you understand how that student, how many in a row they can make. If it's only one or two, you're not there. If they can make 10, 20 balls in a row at, on particular marks on the court, then I think you can start developing proper points. So what I'm seeing is that kids are in live ball situations and they can only make maybe two or three balls. So how do they develop a point properly with strategy? It's not possible. Sorry to tell you for all the listeners that are, that are listening, your child may look fantastic in a bucket drill and a hand felt drill. Those are very controlled drills. The ball is coming into the same spot every single time, whether they're moving or they're stationary. But really, if you put a live ball drill with, with two kids and you put some targets down and you want these specific targets hit, then you can fully understand their discipline, their concentration. If they've had enough proper repetitions in their life, then when, when all of that is, is at a sound level and there's enough proper balls hit and the techniques stay the same and, 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 and a couple other aspects as well, when all those things are set, now we can start talking about how to develop a point properly. But these these are the things that that, that are that are that are tough to do. So many of the parents over the years that have contacted me tell me, well, my child doesn't understand how to play tennis. They can't play points. And and I get them on the court and I tell them, right, <laughs> you are correct. Your <laughs> child doesn't really understand how to play tennis. They don't understand the sport. They may hit a decent ball, you know, every every once in a while, or they may be able to do it a couple of times but they don't have the discipline and the proper repetitions. They can't concentrate for long enough periods of time to be able to even think about how to produce a proper constructed tennis point. And so that, that those are, those are concerns of parents. And I can tell you those things are trained as well. So it, it, it really all depends how, how properly developed each and every individual is. And I will say, I mean, just from being around junior tennis as long as I have, there are some kids that instinctually know how to construct a point. I mean, they they see the court, they see the openings, they understand cause and effect as it pertains to the type of spin they hit, the type of shot they hit, and they just get it. But there are many, many, many other kids, and and I count myself among 
the second group that, you know, they may have great technique and they may be able to hit 20 balls in a row to a target. You know, they may even have that consistency, but even so they don't have that instinct about how to construct a point and they need to be taught that skill. Correct. You you, you are definitely correct. (laughs) Now I can tell you since 2010, the players that I've trained that have come through my door, I'm really trying to think. I'm not sure if I've had any kids that actually understand how to construct points properly over and over again. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm trying to think I'm going, going back. I'm going back in my old brain right now to see back in 2010 and 2012 and 14, 16, Now we're in 2018. It it needed to be taught. I didn't have anyone come through my door where it was so natural for them. They could watch a professional tennis match on TV, fully understand what those pros are doing and and understand why they're hitting these shots and and, and serving here and there and all those things. Um, I'm sure there are kids, but I haven't had any come through my door. Um, And these, I mean, let's say you... You have kids that come to you well into their teens. That that so, is correct. The, so I mean, the these are kids, that, the kids. Right. I mean, so yeah. these are kids so, that have had years of instruction. The, the majority, my, my, I think, I think we spoke about it on the podcast. Yeah. My business started with with kids late, late in their in their teen years that want that wanted or needed to be placed into colleges and right. those types of things. So it, it was. You know, a lot, a lot of repetitions all day long, every single day for them to start achieving their goals. And it needed to happen quickly and well, it was, but, uh, to get them into college. Right. So my point is, is that even though these kids may come to you with the technical skill, they, you know, their families have spent years and presumably tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars on instruction and tournament play and travel and all of that. And they're still coming to you with no tactical experience or understanding. Correct. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. So, so when, so you're saying once a kid has developed the technical skill and the consistency to be able to hit 10, 12, 15, 20 balls in a row to a target, that's the time to start introducing tactics. Is that, am I saying that correctly? Well, yeah, I, I agree. Um, and, and each child is different, but I think that that's a good basis of, of, of where to start. And, and you can, you can see that if the child has the mentality, they have the concentration, they have the focus, they have the discipline that they can hit the ball the same way and it looks the same every single time. The legs look the same, the grip looks the same, the swing looks the same, then mentally they could endure constructing a point properly. Now, how often can they do it? I look back on on, on my younger tennis days of when I was six, eight, ten years old, and my coaches were, were instilling that not only in me, but they were instilling that in all the other players they were developing. There were drills that went a couple hundred balls at that age. And I'm sorry, and it might freak out some of the parents here that are, that are listening to this, but they were developing champions. And so they would say, finish the bucket. And I was so short that I had to look through the net to see how many balls were left in the bucket. And the words that I was thinking about, maybe at that age, I can't really say on this podcast, but it was, oh my, okay, <laughs> let's, let's, let's keep it G rated. Oh my, right. Of, does this guy really want me to finish this bucket of could have been 200 balls left? And it was, yeah. So physically it was hard because he was moving me side to side and all around the court, but he was developing that high, high repetitions and, and concentration and discipline. But that was, that was so great at such a young age because those, those fundamentals are now set. And then when, when I was at that age of eight, 10, 11, 12 years old, then I was going to play practice sets with, with junior players and I could 
hit the ball the same way. And they were telling me, I want a certain amount of balls over here. I want a certain amount of balls over here. I want this type of heaviness on the ball. I want this ball to be flatter. I want, I want an angle. I want you to chip this ball, whatever it was, all those shots were developed already. So mm-hmm. the, the foundation of, of my game, and I'm sure many other players that, that got to a, a high level of tennis, those foundations were set. So it was, it was, it was a little bit of smooth sailing as you kept going through the process of, of, of junior development. And, and we're not just talking about strength of mentality, but you were also developing your physical endurance as a byproduct. So, I mean, were you, Yeah, I mean, it was not only, yeah. So there wasn't a need for you to go hit the gym or go run after practice because you were developing that fitness level that was necessary to achieve what you wanted to achieve every day on the practice court. Is that right? You're not only, you're, you're not only achieving that you're achieving a self belief, a self confidence that how many kids are really doing that? How, how mentally tough are, are, are the kids, right? Mm -hmm. How have, have, have their coaches really challenged them? Have they pushed them? I'm not talking about being abusive to the kids, but have they challenged the, the youngster across the net to see, hey, do you think you can do this? Show me. Let, let's, let's see if we can do this. We're in this together. We're going to do this together. I believe in you. You believe in me. Let's do this together. We're a little team here, and we're going to do amazing things together. And so that just built up so much confidence, so much mental toughness. And you also knew deep down that that person across the net who was helping you achieve this really, really cared for you. Right. Right. But I mean, am I correct in saying that the level of training that you were doing on a day-to-day basis was more than enough to make sure that you were in peak physical condition or did you actually have to hit the gym and hit the treadmill? Well, if your child is struggling physically in, in a tennis tournament match, that means that they're not prepared to be playing in that tournament. If your child is cramping, running out of gas, you know, get getting winded too early, um, then then that means that they're not physically prepared to be enduring that. And then so you have to look at the preparation, and the preparation is the training. Mm-hmm. So um, with, with with drills that are going on for twenty, fifty, hundreds of balls. Yeah, guess what? You go to your tournament and now you're playing 10 ball rallies or 20 ball rallies. That's pretty easy. The training should always be a lot physically challenging than 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 the tournament match. If it's vice versa, then there's something wrong with with the preparation. The tournament matches are actually the easy part physically should be. The 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 tournament matches can be a lot more challenging mentally because there's stress and there's pressure and, you know, and there's line judges and, and all those things. So that could cause, you know, definitely, you know, some nervousness and, and all those things. So mentally it can be a lot more challenging, but physically the tournament matches should not be very challenging for a junior player because hopefully they've put in the proper, the proper time and everything into their training and, the, and their physical fitness. Mm-hmm. Well, going back to the red, orange, green progression. So all this stuff you're talking about, about developing consistency of, of stroke, consistency of grip, consistency of movement, all of that can be done on these colored balls. These are skills that, I mean, presumably that's the reason for the lower bouncing balls, the smaller court is for players to be able to develop those consistencies so that it seems to me, unless I'm missing something here, and Todd, you can correct me, that as these kids are progressing through these red, orange, green ball training sessions and competitions, tactics should be introduced alongside as they reach the milestones for a particular progression level. And I'm I'm saying that really confusingly, but let's say a kid's on red ball and, and they've developed all the skills necessary to allow them to move up to orange ball. 
part of that is consistency. And so therefore, would it be appropriate to introduce tactical training at that stage? Depending, depending on each individual, if they can sustain it physically and mentally, I would say, of course, why, why wouldn't you? Right. That, that's my question is why wouldn't you? Right. And so, and, 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 and can you teach it? Yeah. Well, that's the bigger question. <laughs> so as someone who is so good at teaching tactics, what is the progression for that? Where do you start? Um, I, I think you start as young as you can. Um, I know, but what's, I don't, I don't what's the why. first lesson you're teaching in terms of tactics? Is it serve placement? Is it spin? Is it I mean, you, so a, pro- a proper point? So you 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 have a youngster serve to a particular spot, right? And and they they need to have hit a certain amount of serves in, in their in their life and made sure those repetitions are proper so that they can hit a certain spot, whether it's maybe down the tee or wide, right? And then from there, they need to understand that if you serve here, what's the probability of your opponent to return the ball? Could be down the middle of the court, could be cross court, it could be down the line. So they have to understand not only the anticipation, but they need to understand where they're gonna they're gonna start the point and how they're gonna construct that point. Now I may be getting a little a little technical for maybe for some of the viewers, but these things are trained. So if if your child serves a, a, a particular ball to a to a certain spot and they don't really understand where that opponent is going to be most likely hitting the return, they, they their anticipation skills are are off. And, and so it, it, it could be very normal for that because they haven't, they haven't been taught really how to play and construct proper points. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you have to understand that if I hit a ball over here and, and I hit these certain marks, potentially it's going to give me this shot and this is how I'm breaking down my opponent across the net and, and all, and all these things that, that I'm working on with, with these children on a, on a daily basis as, you know, as well. So it just, as I said, each case is different. And, and I coach based on feel every single kid coming through my door is different. So I have to understand, you know, how, how to connect with them and understand what works for them and, and, and understand the goals and everything. But like I, but like it- I said, this is, um, yeah. No, I mean it's tough, but but in terms of the tactical teaching progression, does it all start with the serve and the return? Is that the first thing you try to teach a kid is, you know, when you serve here, the return is likely to come here or as the returner, if someone's serving to you at this spot in the box, this is where you need to be returning the ball and here's what's going to come back to you? Is that where you start with it? Or is there a different area that you tackle first? Um, in, in, ter- in terms of that, if, if, if I have two kids on a court and, and, and one is working, say, on a T-serve and one's working on, say, I'm thinking of the deuce side right now, so one's working on a, on, a, on a backhand return, that I want both of them to hit specific marks on the court. So, for example, that, that player... Huh, I'm giving you guys my secrets, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so that that, Thank that, you. that particular player hits a good serve down the tee. Then, then the other player hits a backhand return down the line. Right. And so why, why would they do that? So the, the two most important shots in tennis are the serve and they're the return. Okay. That, that's, that's well known. And then the first ball after the serve is obviously a very important shot as well. Probably the next important shot. But if you don't have those, fundamental sound the serve and the return then you're you're definitely behind in the ball game because those are the two most important shots and those are probably the two least practiced shots of kids coming through my door which is definitely a little surprising but kids just hit a lot of tennis balls and 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 uh and whatever but so i want specific targets hit with with those particular shots um and, and and you explain, and explain to them why, why? you explain to them yes. why they need to hit that why. target. Yeah. Well, they have to own it and they have to understand it. I'm not going right. to be on them, you know, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, 10 years in the, in their life, right? They're going to, they're going to need to own this, right? So I tell them and they need to understand hundred percent why that's happening. And, and, and 
in this particular case, why, and for some of the viewers that are listening, why am I saying this, that someone, uh, a child hits a serve down the tee and then the right-handed tennis player hits their backhand down the line. Why? Because if you watch really high-level tennis, okay, and, and I'm basing this on two right-handed tennis players, of course, but if you watch really high-level tennis, if you return that ball down the middle of the court and your opponent gets a first ball forehand, you are automatically on the defense. And you're now a defensive tennis player because you're playing the ball short and down the middle of the court. Okay, and that's where most kids want to play because it's safe and they're scared to miss. Well, you only get to a certain level of tennis with that type of mentality. Okay, so so that's a little basis of, of how and why you would work on those particular things. So, you know, do you have more questions about the strategy, Lisa? Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, because I think – you know, that's what we're trying to focus on here is understanding the progression. So if, if the tactical progression starts with being able to serve to a certain spot and being able to return to a certain spot based on where the serve landed, then what's the next step? Once you can master that or, you know, have a clear understanding of, if he serves here and I return here, then this is going to happen the rest of the point. What what happens next in terms of learning tactics? Well, then it depends on how you want to construct that point. So you have the two most important shots taken care of, which is great. If you have a great serve and, and, and a great return, you're doing quite nice for yourself. Okay, now the server because they're serving, they should be in control, right? So the first ball after the serve is, is what sets the tone for the point, right? But what, what, ha- what happens many times at, in different situations, of course, is that the kids can hit, pro- they, they haven't had the repetitions, they haven't had the proper training to be able to hit certain spots on the court over and over again. So then these points, get, they get sloppy. And so you just start over and you try again and you try again and you try again. And welcome to my little tennis school of Todd Whittem tennis that mm-hmm. we're working on all the time, every single day, hour after hour after hour, not only fixing techniques and everything, but can you construct properly and why are you going to construct proper points this way? And so depending on the strategy after you've, gotten past the serve and the return and the first ball, it depends kind of who's across the net, right? You may have to go side to side with that player because they don't move that well. You may need to break down a side because one of their sides is, is not, is, is, is a, is a problem for them. It just really depends. But if you can't hit these proper targets, like I've said, if going back to training, if you can't hit these proper targets in drills, live ball, you know, you know, fed ball out of the bucket, these things, then how do you do this? It's not Mm -hmm. possible. Right. Right. And so that's what I'm seeing. And and that's the kind of the basis of this show is that that foundation of being able to hit specific spots on the court, making sure you're in position, you've hit the ball the same way you have that mental discipline, mental concentration, being able to focus for, for long periods of time. Now we can talk about what we're talking about right now. Right. So the progression is not just a matter of learning strokes and grips, but there's also a very definite progression in terms of fitness level, in terms of mental uh, uh, stamina, for lack of a better word. And then once those things are honed and developed properly, you can start developing the tactical side of the game. Am I saying that properly? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I think, I think that that's, that's proper what, what, what you're saying, but you can't skip any steps mm-hmm. and then ask of the coach or your son or daughter, well, why are you playing this way? Or why are you playing that way? When they don't have this, this fundamental, the, the fundamental solid, it's, right. it's, it's, it's like going from, you know, it's it's like not teaching your, your son or daughter about addition and subtraction and telling them, well, you're just going to start doing division. It's yeah. not possible. 
<laughs> I mean, in, unless you have a genius, I mean, I don't, I don't, uh, hopefully my children are geniuses, but you know, I, I wouldn't bet on it, but in, <laughs> unless you have an absolute genius, right. Is that right? Ha, ha, you, can, you can't skip that step. It's not possible. But even with a genius, they're not skipping steps. They're just going through the steps more right. quickly. They're going quicker. They're going right. through the process quicker. Right. And I think, I think that's the same thing with a, you know, a quote genius athlete. You may be able to speed up the progression, but you still have to go through each step. Right. I'll give, I'll give you a little example from, from yet, from, from yesterday's practice. Okay. Two boys, they're they're 15, they're 16 years old and they're playing points out, out of their hand, which is you feed it down the middle the 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 first ball is down the middle you play the whole point out like you're like you're in a point right normal you play to you play to 10 or you can play to 11 whatever it doesn't matter okay so they play and all of a sudden and and keep in mind they've already been training for an hour and they did their cross courts and they hit the ball on the targets and everything was looking great right then i say all right guys you're going to compete now out of the hand and we'll get into serving points later and and, and all these things. And now I want to see if they can construct properly. Okay. So the, the first boy feeds the ball. The next one, the next one hits the first ball down the middle. Now they're allowed to open the court. Like, like they're in, like they're in a match, right? Well, these kids are all of a sudden moving back, playing defensive and playing down the middle of the court, scared, scared to make mistakes. And the, and the, and the, the first response is guys, why, are you guys playing any different than you did in the drills that we just did where you were hitting the targets and everything? If you do not apply what you just did in those drills, hitting those targets, and you don't apply it to these points, those drills meant did not mean much at all. Mm-hmm. But the mentality is wrong. So here's the next step because these players are, are not really playing the points properly. I put cones down on the court and all of a sudden they're hitting the cones. Right, they're hitting the cones now in a point situation, and they then and, and now they're they were they were smiling at smiling at Pierre and I, both of us. Hmm. Right. So the second I said points, all of a sudden they got tight, they got nervous, they didn't want to lose, they got scared. But if that's your mentality, then how are you going to progress? You're not going to learn. You're not going to progress right. with that type of mentality. Right, but and so- that, and that's what I'm talking about with with a change of mentality for many kids. But that's a coach paying really close attention to what's going on. And instead of letting the kids continue to play that way, safe up the middle, defensive, you took them back a a step and said, okay, you know, this is not what we're doing today. We're not working on your defensive skills. We've been working all day on, you know, if this, then that. So... Let me take you back a step. We're going to stick some cones on the court. And if you don't hit the cones, that's when you lose, right? I mean, so so you created a situation for them as their coach that I encouraged, forced them to play the way you wanted them to play that day. A lot of coaches wow. would have either not seen it, not noticed it, or not done anything and just let them continue to play safe up the middle defensive tennis. And then they would have gone home having learned this new skill, but then not put it into action. And then it's gone. And that's what I'm talking about when I say wasting time and wasting money. To me, that would be a waste. Yeah, it really depends on how productive your practices are and what each and every child needs. And that, and I've said that long for, for many years already, how productive are your practices? That That's, that's really what it boils down to. These, these particular players, they started to play very safe. They played scared. They played down the middle of the court and then you put targets down and they start, they start to understand that I need to be placing the ball here and there. And why am I playing a couple to this target and opening the court? And they're learning. They're, they're learning right before but- they're just hitting balls and running. That, that that's not learning. Right. That's that's that that's just playing tennis. But that's not understanding tennis. That's that's those are two totally different things. Right. And and I guess the point I'm trying to hammer home here for my listeners is if your child is in a coaching situation where 
the coaches are allowing the player to get away with not implementing the skills that they've been working on, then you are wasting that child's time and money and your money. <laughs> so I, I just, I, I guess, Todd, one of the things I love about you is you're so tuned in to every single player that's with you and you are so quick to notice when things are not going the way you want them to go and, and figuring out how to get what you want out of each player each day. Not all coaches have that skill or have that level of involvement with their players or level of interest in their players. And I, I'm really just trying to point out to the listeners that, that what you're doing, Todd, is an example of a phenomenal tennis coach. This is what every child deserves to have every day on the practice court. And most of our kids don't get that. Well, I, I appreciate those kind words, but that's why I was hired by, by the families. That, that's, yeah. what, that's, what, that's what they've <laughs> exactly. been here for. That's my job. That's what I enjoy most. Keep in mind, obviously, parents are paying me well, but that's what I enjoy most. I enjoy trying to do this properly. It's not get on, get on the court, get off the court, and, and write me a check. That, to me, that's boring. Of course, I could do that. But that, to me, that, that's, not, that's not exciting for me to get on the court each and every day. It's just not. Yeah. Well, I wish more coaches had that same attitude. I know there are many out there who do, but there are also many who do not. And again, you know, I just, I love having you on because you set the bar very high for what a junior coach should be. And I think the more that the Parenting Aces audience can hear you and, and understand your approach to the game, uh, the more likely they are to to understand what they should be looking for in a coach for their own child. And so I, I love that you take the time to come chat with us and I really appreciate it. And I know my listeners do too. And so thank you for that. Well, thank you, Lisa. Uh, this is a fun hour for myself and hopefully yeah. the, the listeners appreciate it and then they learn and uh, hopefully their child is on a great path for them for them to be developing and learning new skills and for them to achieve their goals and dreams with their tennis career agreed thank you again for coming on and to my listeners thank you so much for tuning in and we'll catch you next time on parenting aces i'm lisa stone and you've been listening to the parenting aces podcast for tennis parents by a tennis parent if you like what you've heard, please subscribe to us and write a review on iTunes. For more information on navigating the junior and college tennis journey, please visit us online at parentingaces.com. Thanks for tuning in and sharing us with your tennis community.